Okay, today we're going to talk about the first parts of the Venezuelan revolutions, uh, largely in the 18-teens. Uh, there's a long series of different factions and different wars, so much like the Mexican revolutions or the Mexican wars for independence that we talked about last time, the Venezuelan revolutions are extremely confusing because they happen in phases, uh, and it's really not until the last phase that one of them is successful, so after the second or third or even fourth attempt at revolution. Uh, so first we'll talk about the major kind of background causes for the revolution and what would become known as Venezuela uh, by the end of today, and then how the independence movement gets going in 1810, 1811, and then we'll go through the different phases, the so-called different republics and we'll end up in uh, 1819, 1820. So first thing is go through the major causes. Uh, the biggest cause was the ongoing Spanish versus French war that started in 1808 as a result of Napoleon's demands that Portugal and Spain adhere to the continental system. So we've talked about that already before in relation to other uh, rebellions and other revolutions in Latin America. So Venezuelans uh, also, you know, the ones who want full independence see this as an opportunity, but most Venezuelans are simply, by 1810, they just argue that the colony, uh, the colony in northern South America, the northern coastline, uh, what's known as New Granada, uh, cannot constitutionally separate from the monarchy. So that in the times where the monarch is kind of absent or he's not really running things, as seemed to be happening in Spain because the official monarch, Ferdinand VII, is under this uh, kind of house arrest in France, so he's like an absentee monarch. Uh, the politicians in the colony in New Granada argue that since the monarch is absent, basically, uh, that government power kind of derives down, it falls down, filters down to the people on the local level. So they're going to use that argument to start um, promoting what will become known as the autonomous movements in New Granada, which means that a lot of these people will argue that basically the colony is going to have to run itself while the monarch is absent or in another country or whatever is going on. Uh, so they're going to set up what they call kind of home rule. The colony is going to run itself in Ferdinand VII's name and that they will invite him to still be their king, um, and they hope that he'll come back to his throne and actually start governing again at some point soon. But until that happens, the colony is going to have to run itself. Uh, leaders in Spain do not really accept that constitutional argument, um, and they do not accept the idea that the American colonies can divide themselves from Spanish authority or that they can start running themselves on the kind of colonial local level. So the Spanish authorities in Spain itself do not accept that argument and they're going to start resorting to force and violence to uh, convince the American colonists to remain loyal to the Spanish government and remain a full-fledged colony under Spanish leadership. So the Spanish government in Spain basically argues that the colonies should not be doing that stuff. They should not be trying to rule themselves and that they're still colonies and they have to follow orders from Spain. The problem though is that a lot of different colonies start making the kind of autonomy argument at least for this moment of crisis where the king is absent. So a lot of the different uh, kind of revolutionary movements we're going to talk about this time and next time will start to look very similar to each other because a lot of colonists make uh, very same political arguments. So, and a lot of these arguments uh, tend to kind of break down between uh, where people lived in the colonies, especially in New Granada. So a lot of the city-based leaders, a lot of the urban leaders where the big populations are and obviously where the big kind of government functionaries are, where the bureaucracy is, the kind of colonial capital cities will look to continue enforcing Spain's orders from the Spanish government. So a lot of the city leaders still see themselves as colonists under orders from the home country. While out in the countryside, in the rural agricultural areas, a lot of those leaders argue that they had the power to create their own local juntas uh, and that um, 
they have the authority to kind of rule the colony themselves while the king is absent. So a lot of these uh, kind of revolutionary movements in the colonies will break down into really a civil war also in the colony itself between the royalists who live in the cities very often and the autonomists who live out in the countryside or the agricultural areas. And one thing to note is that the wealthy elite of both areas are fairly evenly split between which side they're going to join in these conflicts. And another big problem we'll have for uh, especially the South American revolutions uh, going far into the future, which we'll also talk about next time, is that uh, a lot of those cities and colonial governments, the vice royalty governments, uh, are along the Pacific coastline. So they face the Pacific coast, which means that there's a kind of communication and transportation delay because the ships that come from Spain sail across the Atlantic and they can land on the Atlantic side of the Americas and unload and maybe send messages. But in order to get those messages to the western coastlines that are uh, on the Pacific coast, they often have to move overland or if they have they have to take their boat all the way around the southern tip of South America. So it just takes a whole lot more time uh, to get messages to the western coast. So uh, a lot of areas like New Spain uh, undergoing the Mexican Wars for Independence, the Caribbean Islands, and Venezuela, larger that we'll talk about today, which is on the northern, northeastern coast of South America, uh, they won't have those problems because they face the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so now we'll get into the kind of uh, outbreak of all these independence ideas, or at least autonomy ideas, very early on, 1810. So news of the French takeover of Spain and uh, the ongoing wars between the Spanish juntas and uh, the French occupiers starts to get into the colonies in 1809, 1810, and then in January 1810, uh, big news arrived in the colonies that the French military had basically defeated uh, the Spanish juntas, and the French have now solidly kind of control over all of Spain under Napoleon's brother Joseph Bonaparte's been named King of Spain. Uh, so they seem fairly solidly in control, and that scares a lot of the colonists out in the Americas. So that convinced particularly the wealthy elite in Caracas, uh, the big city of what is today Venezuela, to form a junta themselves in the spring of 1810. So this junta that they create uh, really translates to the Supreme Junta to conserve the rights of Fernando VII. So Ferdinand VII. And this is their flag in this image. So they are looking to build their own type of um, revolutionary movement largely to reject the French control over Spain and reject any orders coming from Spain under that French occupation led by the Bonapartes. So this group is interesting because they say that they want to run New Granada, run what is today Venezuela, uh, largely for the benefit of Ferdinand VII and the normal government that should be in office in Spain. Uh, so they say that they're going to kind of run the colony basically until the legitimate Spanish leadership comes back into office and then they will go back to just kind of following orders from Spain as the home country. So this group refuses to proclaim outright independence from the Spanish monarchy or the Spanish government. They are not looking to create an entirely new country. So this is not really a revolution so much as it's a kind of rebellion message uh, to the French people running Spain saying we're not going to follow your orders and you don't dare send people here um, because they won't be listened to and they might be arrested or something like that. So nearly all the leading powerful groups in Caracas supported this uh, junta that becomes known as the Supreme Junta or the Junta Suprema of Caracas. So uh, most of the kind of wealthy businessmen and government leaders in Caracas generally support this idea. They support the Supreme Junta. Um, 
they might have historians argue that they the junta may have been doing this because they hate a lot of the spanish um anti-merchant laws that were coming from spain so they may be using this as an excuse to get around those things um but some of the outlying towns and cities outside of caracas uh, still continue to side with the Spanish government, even that the Bonapartes are leading. Uh, so some historians argue that a lot of these Caracas leaders are you know, taking this step for their own economic benefit, and a lot of the surrounding towns are very afraid of this step because they think that the uh, leaders in Caracas are basically trying to take over the colony uh, for their own benefit, and a lot of the other towns don't want to basically be run by the the elites in Caracas. So there's that uh, type of internal arguing amongst the major towns um, and cities and population centers along the coastline. But the Junta Suprema itself does uh, several like, really big, several fairly revolutionary things while it's in power. Uh, so it puts forward several major reforms. So it ended a lot of the trade restrictions that Spain had enforced on its colonies. Uh, so the Junta Suprema will basically declare free trade to allow trade ships to go from one colony to another uh, throughout the uh, Spanish Empire uh, without any major restrictions anymore. Uh, they ended the Alcabala, the sales tax, uh, on food and other essential items. Uh, and they heavily reduced the tax rate on other non-essential items, but stuff that you know people tend to buy and use in the economy anyway. Uh, they ended the native tribute system, which was a very heavily kind of economically repressive system that kind of borders on the idea of economic slavery applied to the natives. So the Junta Suprema got rid of that whole kind of uh, economic enslavement system over the natives. Um, and it also ended the slave trade. So it formally ended the importation of new slaves into the colony. So that's a kind of getting close to the idea of ending slavery completely in the colony, though they don't take that step exactly. Uh, and the Junta Supremis will start sending messages to other European colonies throughout uh, the New World and will even start seeking the political support of the United States. Um, so they start sending messages to other colonies saying that these are good ideas and uh, start sending uh, messages to the U.S. government asking for political support, asking for U.S. ships to come to New Granada and open trade relations to keep their economy going. They even asked the U.S. government for weapons. Um, so the Junta is looking for opportunities to grow their economy, but also grow their military defenses and their political contacts with their neighbors in order to you know, guarantee some amount of stability. So the Junta may have been figuring that the, the French that are running the Spanish government, they're going to attack at some point, and they're looking to uh, kind of uh, empower the colony for its own defense. But a lot of historians argue that all of these actions really reflect the elite uh, Spanish merchants in New Granada and in some instances uh, also reflect a lot of the agricultural interest especially the big kind of plantation owners um, in the colony itself so again it looks like the the Junta Suprema in Caracas is largely also vested in its own economic interests and uh, next big thing it does a little bit later is it orders uh, local elections throughout the towns and cities um, in the colony to uh, convene a congress of representatives. Um, and you know we now know that uh, the junta then tried to run the election to be fairly restrictive. I mean, only men over 25 years old. Uh, that were fairly wealthy, had over 2,000 pesos in, in money or property, could get a vote in this. So it's a very restricted democracy, uh, but the junta wants to run this election to choose representatives to finally determine what uh, Venezuela's status is. Is it a colony of Spain? Does it have to follow Spanish government orders? Or is it moving more toward home rule and possible independence? <laughs> 
Uh, the Spanish government, though, under French leadership, again, under the Bonapartes, are really outraged that um, the colony has tried this at all. So Spain sends warships uh, to basically blockade the Venezuelan coastline. So on this map here, we see Venezuela, kind of modern Venezuela, basically in blue. And this red line out in the ocean is where the Spanish ships will basically go out there and sit. They'll sit at anchor and sail back and forth across the red line, um, trying to enforce a blockade to stop any uh, traders from coming in and accessing Caracas or the other major towns and cities, which are almost always along the coastline, the northern coastline. So this is an attempt at economic warfare from the Spanish government in order to force the colony back into compliance with the Spanish government demands. So this move really outraged the uh, uh, Caracas population, especially the radicals in Caracas that um, will start uh, demanding more and more independence and autonomy from the Spanish government, basically arguing that the Spanish government has no right to do these kinds of things, is going to damage the colony, and no uh, kind of legitimate or upstanding, trustworthy Spanish government would do this against their own people. So there's a, this blockade only increases the calls for more autonomy, more possible independence. Uh, there's also calls, growing calls for autonomy way out west in the city of Quito, which is here on this red dot that I just added. Um, so that part of New Granada is generally known as Quito, the whole kind of greenish area, uh, but the capital city itself is also called Quito. Um, and the Spanish government there uh, doesn't want to deal with uh, independence or autonomy movements at all. So when the autonomists start to gather in that city in late July, early August, um, the Spanish authorities just come out and massacre them by the hundreds. And so that adds to a lot of the anger that a lot of the colonists are feeling against the Spanish government throughout uh, this whole kind of uh, area in all these different colors, green, purple, blue, uh, even these reddish areas. That's all basically the Viceroyalty of New Granada as we start all this in 1810. Um, so the, the word spreads that the Spanish government, the uh, Viceroyalty government is starting to um, kind of take reprisals against the autonomy movement and starting to attack it. So the radicals will start to um, basically make an argument for more and more autonomy kind of starting to border on independence and they'll start making uh, promises to a whole bunch of different segments of the population if you support independence and we do become an independent country then we'll give you you know x y or z um, you can fill in the blanks so um, a lot of the radicals make promises to uh, creoles and other people that have grown up in this colony that uh, were not from Spain or originally. So uh, the radicals will start to promote uh, Creole riots throughout the colony. And uh, the radicals will increasingly say that anyone who um, was not kind of either born in, in the colony or does not fully support uh, the colony's autonomy from the Spanish government that they should just completely leave. They should just go home. So that's an interesting argument uh, accusing a lot of people that were born in Spain and came to the colony of basically not being colonists. Uh, that the colonists are a different people from the Spanish and that the Spanish should quote basically go home. Uh, get out of the colony and go back to where you came from. So that's a big kind of stepping off point. That's a big launch point into a whole kind of new level of how they see the Spanish government as a possible like occupying enemy force. So um, the Junta Suprema though, they, they don't like a lot of these statements coming from the most radicals. And the Junta Suprema doesn't like uh, a lot of these riots that are going to get started, especially amongst the Creoles. So the Junta Suprema wants more kind of measured 
complaint. They want to complain to the Spanish government about what they're doing, but they don't want to use violent tactics and they do not want to continue calling for any type of independence movement or separation from Spain at all. So the Junta Suprema is very worried about this type of stuff. And uh, one thing the radicals really want is to uh, bring back their most revolutionary leader, a guy named Francisco Miranda, who is currently living in exile in Britain in kind of 1810. Uh, so the really hardcore radicals in the colony, they want to bring back their kind of revolutionary leader. And the Junta Suprema really puts his foot down and says, no, we're not going to invite that guy back. He's not allowed to set foot in the colony anymore. He's, he's been banned. But the radicals will increasingly kind of organize, organize themselves into local groups and clubs to kind of amplify their voice and continue their uh, kind of growth of their revolutionary demands. And eventually, uh, that pressure on the junta becomes too much to bear. And they allow Miranda, eventually, to return from exile and to come back into Venezuela in very late 1810 in December. So he's going to get directly involved immediately with these uh, radical groups, these local clubs, and will start basically a propaganda campaign. They're going to start printing a lot of materials and giving speeches and going to government meetings and really will just be kind of a, a thorn in the side of the Junta Suprema, um, increasingly calling for independence into the spring of 1811. So uh, the next step is really that uh, that Congress that they were having elections for in Venezuela, it actually convenes in March 1811. So it sets up a short-term government and sets up some uh, kind of voting rights, uh, mostly restrict the property owners, which tends to you know, anger the whole rest of the population, especially uh, kind of working class people who don't own a lot of property themselves or cattle raisers or agricultural workers or something like that. Um, but the radicals are still present even as this Congress convenes and starts talking about a constitution or what are they going to do. So by July, these radicals and their propaganda campaign have uh, really forced a debate on independence for July 5th. So it's scheduled for July 5th, 1811. And at that debate, the radicals kind of bring their own supporters in and they pack the meeting hall. And they demand that the elected congressmen basically um, accept the idea of independence. So the radicals pack the hall with their own people. They are screaming and shouting. And they're even intimidating the congressmen, uh, trying to convince them to support independence. And the congressmen do vote for independence that day under this massive amount of, of popular pressure. And uh, this independence vote also creates a yellow, blue, and red tricolor flag that uh, this newly proclaimed independent country of Venezuela will use as its new national flag. And even when this independence vote is taken and they'll kind of draft a statement of independence for the world to read, um, that statement will not accuse the Spanish monarchy of really doing anything wrong. It mostly just says that um, the so-called ancient compact with the Spanish monarchy has been disrupted since 1808 uh, because of the war against the French and the fact that the official Spanish monarch is kind of out in exile and he's not really running the Spanish government anymore. So this new government is known as the First Republic. And it will start working on, a, on an official constitution from July going forward. And uh, that constitution will eventually be finished in December by the end of 1811. The problem, though, is that most Venezuelans, most people living in this uh, new country, never supported full independence. And um, a lot of the population in this new country actually preferred to... Uh, keep loyalty to the Spanish monarchy or to the Regency Council that's now running the Spanish war against the French occupation in Spain. So most 
people living in newly independent Venezuela do not want an independent Venezuela. They want to remain a colony of Spain. And it was really uh, the independence movement was successful because of the mass pressure at that one meeting in July. So uh, the Congress, though, does complete its constitution in December 1811. So we can go through quickly kind of what that constitution proclaimed. Uh, it, number one, declared that all people are free, but only, again, landowners get voting rights. So it's a fairly restricted type of democracy. Uh, it ended the slave trade, so no importation of new slaves into Venezuela, but did not outlaw slavery itself in Venezuela. So slavery in the country will continue. They just can't bring in any new slaves. Uh, the Constitution also abolishes any kind of hereditary, inherited, and institutional privileges. Um, so that's a kind of shot against the elite, really, and their ability to avoid taxes or something like that. Um, it keeps a fairly weak like commission as an executive branch. So the, the congressmen who write the Constitution are very interested in keeping the legislature as the dominant power in this new government. And it um, uh, creates a National Guard to oversee slaves in Venezuela to make sure that they don't start a slave uprising. And they create a lot of vagrancy laws and restrictions on a lot of the agricultural workers, especially the cattle raisers that go from one place to another in this new country, um, largely apparently because they fear the unified political power of the cattle raisers in Venezuela. So the Constitution in general tends to keep a lot of the kind of Spanish white landowners in power and work to control the slaves or the Creoles um, that are largely the working class or the kind of agricultural workers. Um, and many historians write that that's because the kind of white Europeans that are basically running this new country are very afraid of any... Uh, kind of racial uprising that would be reminiscent of what happened in Haiti uh, because these landowners are extremely afraid of that kind of violence coming to get them someday. So a lot of the Creoles um, don't really like this new government very much because they still feel very oppressed and their vote doesn't matter so much. And uh, they're very angry at this new government for these uh, very kind of uh, hard to take restrictions on their movement, on their democratic powers, on their voting rights and whatnot. So a lot of the Creoles actually side with the uh, loyalists in Venezuela. They'll side with the monarchy. They want to remain a colony um, because they felt that they got kind of a better deal as a colonist in the Spanish Empire than they're getting from this new constitution. So a lot of the Creoles and the working class types uh, in the country are a clearly a, a threat to the government's survival because uh, they don't like this government. And uh, the, the real radicals who want you know, full-scale independence and whatnot, uh, they're a pretty small minority of the Venezuelan population. Uh, but they're a very loud and vocal and organized minority because they have these kind of radical groups all throughout the major towns and cities in Venezuela. So uh, as the First Republic gets going under its constitution, there's immediately a lot of rumors about conspiracies to overthrow it or um, to just turn uh, this new country back into a colony and hand it over to Spain. So the, the First Republic has a lot of problems going forward. And the First Republic basically named uh, Miranda uh, general to go out and attack any towns that are full of loyalists or something like that. And Miranda will start doing that. Um, he will basically use a lot of violent tactics to uh, try to overcome any loyalist sentiment in the major towns and cities in Venezuela. Uh, as he does so, he largely angers the Creole population, which is a big mistake because the Creoles are such a big part of the Venezuelan population, um, that once they become angered at something that Miranda has done, uh, some type of violence he kind of implemented against their community in whatever place, 
uh, in the country that um, you know the Creoles can be a revolutionary group themselves and because they're such a large part of the population they might be able to start a anti-Venezuela revolution and just overthrow this new government. So there's a lot of debates in the new Congress over did Miranda's kind of violent military tactics, uh, did they work to uh, achieve the goal of unifying the new country? Or did they split popular opinion and therefore bring the uh, possible threat of a kind of civil war in the country? Uh, the government, though, is also, you know, undergoing a lot of problems and a lot of problems that are very con uh, kind of consistent amongst new governments. Uh, number one is just money. Uh, the new government is having trouble collecting taxes. Um, so they start, uh, you know, issuing paper money. Uh, which causes a lot of inflation, which does even more kind of economic damage. So uh, within a few months, this new First Republic revolutionary government is basically nearing bankruptcy. And it starts making a lot of desperate economic decisions, especially related to money and tax payments that is going to you know, anger a lot of different portions of the Venezuelan population. And it will be a very dangerous time uh, in the First Republic. And uh, after the year closes, going into the year 1812, a new royalist uh, army shows up uh, under a guy named Monteverde, General Monteverde. And so he will start launching attacks to overthrow the First Republic and turn uh, Venezuela back, basically, back into a colony. So this General Monteverde is invading especially the western part of Venezuela and very successfully because a lot of towns gave up without a fight. Um, and many historians point to the idea that a lot of those town leaders and those town populations, um, they are giving up on the First Republic, the revolutionary government in general, because it seems so chaotic. Um, they're doing a lot of things that are harming the economy. So the people have just uh, said, sure, Spanish government, come back in with your army and we're not going to resist you because what this revolutionary government is doing is even worse. So Monteverde has uh, basically reconquered major parts of western Venezuela by the end of March 1812. So uh, the radical solution to this, the real independence-minded people, their solution is to give even more power to Miranda to basically declare him a general and a dictator of the whole country in order to uh, stabilize the country and uh, kick out this, this Spanish invading force. So Miranda takes up these new powers and immediately declares martial law, which means um, basically that people have to follow these simple government rules and if you don't follow you can be executed or jailed. So, number one, he declares martial law in the whole area, all of Venezuela. And number two, he uh, immediately orders any Spanish living in Venezuela to be arrested. So that's going to, again, split the population between uh, Creoles and kind of uh, homegrown Venezuelan colonists who uh, were born and raised in the colony uh, against the Spanish that Francisco Miranda is now targeting. Um, Miranda also offered freedom to any slave who served in the Republican army, basically his, his army, for 10 years. So a lot of slaves thought this might be a good idea, but 10 years is a long time to fight in the army before you're declared uh, not a slave anymore, before you're declared free. And this move uh, also alienates and angers a lot of the merchants and a lot of the landowners who basically fear that uh, Miranda's promises to the slaves will, um, you know, cause these landowners and merchants and whatnot to lose their labor force. So a lot of the merchants and business owners and whatnot start to turn against Miranda and the First Republic government. Uh, because of that, they're afraid of the economic hit they're going to take when they lose their slave labor.
and the Catholic Church will even get involved in these discussions and will make a kind of counter offer, a secret appeal to a lot of the slaves um, to basically fight with the royalists to overthrow this new government and, and make the whole area back into a Spanish colony again. And that's fairly successful because a lot of those Creoles and African slaves have more connections with the lower class uh, Spanish workers because they kind of work closely together on a daily basis. Whereas uh, the Republican movement, the First Republic, the Independence Movement, is largely largely led by merchants and uh, the big landowners who are really the big slave owners in that region. So uh, the slaves and the Creoles naturally uh, kind of define the slave owners as their enemy. And they'll look to join any force that wants to fight their enemy. And so they become uh, Spanish government loyalists. So the first government, the first republic government is in a lot of big problems and it basically collapses in July. All right, so uh, a lot of black troops will therefore just kind of logically side with the royalists uh, because they think they might get a better deal if uh, the, the area reverts to a colony rather than keeping independence. And uh, General Miranda surrendered all of his Republican armies to the Spanish general Monteverde by the end of July. Therefore, Monteverde has basically won the war. And he issues what is called the Capitulacion of San Mateo, which is basically the offer of uh, peace to the rebels, the anti-government rebels who had declared independence and you know fought for independence and in, and in the first republic. So uh, the deal is basically that uh, the Republicans will be allowed to keep their property in Venezuela. Um, even some of the property which they had uh, taken from others uh, after the revolt started. Another part is that there will be no reprisals, no you know, long jail sentences or executions or anything like that for the rebel leaders, for the Republicans. And um, any Republican who had been defeated, if they don't want to be in this area anymore, if they don't want to be in that colony, uh, they can apply for passports to, to leave the New Granada colony and go somewhere else. And the official end happens when uh, a lot of the Republicans distrust General Miranda and they think that, they, that he sold them out. So uh, they order a, a lower level kind of lieutenant in Miranda's army named Simon Bolivar to arrest Miranda. And this kind of conflict amongst the leaders basically ends the First Republic. Miranda is eventually taken captive and sent off to prison in Spain where he'll later, later die. So that takes Miranda basically out of the equation for the long term. And uh, Bolivar is really the guy who replaces Miranda as the big kind of name, the big leader of uh, the future independence movements. So Bolivar is one of the major kind of independence leaders by default at this point, at least military leaders. And uh, he largely accepts the capitulation uh, and he becomes very angry though when Monteverde just kind of refuses to actually enforce all those deals. So Miranda will start to actually confiscate uh, Republican leaders lands and uh, Bolivar was one of the wealthier landowners by this point in New Granada so he's very angry when uh, Monteverde comes to take his own personal lands So uh, Bolivar at first, once, once all the fighting is over, uh, once the First Republic collapses, uh, Bolivar basically you know, travels to Britain to take part in the, the fight uh, to overthrow the French leadership that has occupied the Spanish government's controlling it. But Bolivar, once he hears that his own personal lands are under attack back in the colony, he quickly gets on a boat and goes back over there and complains about it. And that will start off the next phase, which is basically the Bolivarian revolutions that get going in 1812 and will go for several years until 1819, 1820.
And a lot of these revolutions uh, will get going largely because of Monteverdi's own political uh, mistakes, where he's going to start splitting up his own support base. And one way he does that is by he... Um, at first he was promising a lot of these uh, African soldiers and slaves that if they joined his army that he would uh, kind of attack the Republicans and take their land and possibly even hand out that land to the the African soldiers that are going to join Monteverdi's army. And uh, after he won the war and uh, the First Republic is gone, basically Monteverdi went back on that promise. Um, he instead uh, he did confiscate a lot of the Republican land, with, which obviously angered Bolivar and other of the major landowners. But he also, instead of giving that land out to the African soldiers that he had promised, he tended to keep it for himself and his officers and friends. And they, he tries to set them up as basically a, a brand new uh, wealth and power base in the colony. And probably even worse, he completely halted any uh, black person's ability to, to get out of slavery in the colony, which absolutely annihilated his support base amongst the Creoles and amongst uh, anyone from Af of African descent that has been enslaved. And the last big mistake is uh, some not that Monteverdi did, but we have to remember that there's a constitution in Spain that's being created in 1812 that would basically mean the release of Republican prisoners that Monteverdi has taken. And um, the constitution would also remove a lot of Monteverdi's royalist supporters from office because of favoritism. And so that tends to anger a lot of his own supporters. Uh, so he's really kind of split up his support base into different factions, and they're all arguing against each other uh, by the end of 1812. And so Creole leaders will start a new revolt against Monteverdi in 1813, and Bolivar will raise an army from New Granada, uh, further to the west of Venezuela, and in 1813, uh, Bolivar will kind of join these Creole leaders in a re new revolt against Monteverde. And during this revolt, Bolivar issues a very famous document that becomes known as his War of Death Decree, or War to the Death Decree, in June of 1813. And historians have analyzed this in quite a lot of depth. And basically, they argue that he demanded the execution of any Spanish who refused to fully fight for Venezuelan independence. So any person from Spain that's in Venezuela, uh, if they're not fully supporting the revolution to make Venezuela into an independent country again, uh, then they should be executed. But uh, his war to the death idea also... Uh, says that anyone born in the Americas, uh, they're not going to be punished so heavily, especially if they join the Loyalist side in these conflicts. Uh, historians also argue that this decree was his attempt to force Americans to choose sides between um, you know, his own power base or Monteverde's. But mass executions of Spanish will begin in different towns under this war to the death idea. So a lot of the Spanish who had grown up in Spain and come over to the colonies, uh, they're being wiped out, basically. And Bolivar will announce the creation of what he calls a second republic under himself in later 1813, uh, so he'll set himself up basically as a military dictator under this new government. And uh, largely because he thought that the First Republic fell because of its own internal weaknesses, basically that its Congress was too weak, it allowed too much debate and dissent, and um, that that Congress didn't have a very strong military to defend itself. 
So Bolivar looks to uh, create a much more centralized Second Republic under his own leadership as dictator in order to solve a lot of what he saw as the kind of uh, excessive democracy problems of the First Republic. But Bolivar still has to deal with uh, big areas of Venezuela that are still in royalist hands. Because, you know, just because they start announcing a new government doesn't mean that everyone in Venezuela accepts it. And Bolivar will also move to totally destroy any of the Spanish or other Europeans who had worked with the slaves or anyone of African descent. So Bolivar will start off on mass executions, which will number eventually in the thousands by the end of 1814. Uh, the Creoles themselves will divide between kind of royalists and republicans, uh, which is always a big danger um, in any of these kind of revolutionary movements where the population can be split politically. But the Second Republic under Bolivar has several major important kind of social divisions. Uh, number one are the republicans, the people who want independence for Venezuela, versus the Spanish government loyalists, or uh, many historians call them the royalists the people who support the monarchy and want the want Venezuela to remain a colony under the Spanish Empire. So uh, the Creoles will largely again split between supporting the Republicans or the Loyalists, which is a you know big problem because the Creoles are a massive proportion of the population and Bolivar cannot find a way to uh, keep them on his side completely. But again, uh, the white Republicans, even uh, people like Bolivar himself, uh, they're very worried about any potential race war breaking out um, because they're just afraid that Venezuela can turn into another Haiti, where the former slaves rode up or rose up and they uh, fought a civil war to get rid of the slave owners and. Uh, free themselves and that implied a lot of violence against the former slave owners so the government that Bolivar is trying to lead is divided in a whole bunch of different ways also and you throw in another division where a lot of Creole and black troops that had fought with the loyalists against Bolivar and uh, the independence minded people um, once the royalist forces are kind of defeated, uh, the black forces, the African army that had been with them, basically flee into the countryside uh, while Bolivar kind of conquers Caracas and sits in Caracas, the big city. And uh, the big black general named Jose Tomas Boves will go out into the countryside and will build cavalry units, uh, basically soldiers on horseback, to uh, basically try to take over Venezuela and kick out all of the Europeans, all of the white landowners, and try to reconfiscate the land and parcel it out to um, former slaves. So that's a major land redistribution promise that Boves make to, made to his own supporters. And this kicks off a major civil war between Boves and uh, the Republican leaders, especially Bolivar. And uh, the amount of racial hatreds in this war are very extreme. And so this becomes basically a massive race-based civil war amongst uh, the former colonists. And uh, Bolivar is in a really difficult position because he has to fight off loyalists and he has to fight off now the Boves forces. Which is very difficult to win what historians call a two-front war when you're fighting two enemies in two different places at the same time. But Bolivar is successful by spring, late spring of 1814 in defeating most of the major royalist forces, but then he has to contend with uh, the, the black army under Bovis. Uh, 
And so he'll turn to attack Bovis in June of 1814, just a month after basically finishing off the Royalist forces. But um, many historians argue that Bolivar really flubbed uh, the attack on the black forces, um, his own military mistakes, his leadership mistakes, allowed Bovis to completely surround and defeat Bolivar's army, even though Bolivar's forces heavily outnumbered Bovis's. So Bolivar, at that point, leaves Venezuela. He runs away in order to save himself. Bovis goes off and attacks the very last of the Republican forces after Bolivar fled the country and basically ran away to save himself. And uh, Bovis and his army will basically spread a horribly violent racial, racist terror war against the Venezuelan population. So Bovis and Bolivar are kind of equally brutal and ruthless and ambitious. But Bovis himself later died at the kind of height of his power in December 1814. Uh, he died on the battlefield, basically. And now that you know Bolivar and the independence-minded people are out of the country, and Bovis is dead and his movement kind of collapses after his death, that leaves an open opportunity for the royalists to then retake power so while Bovis died really at the height of his power, um, the white Europeans that are living in Venezuela, they are still paranoid of any kind of race war. All right, so at this point, the Spanish government has really had it with all these different revolutionary movements and all this infighting and violence. Um, so they will send a new general with 10,000 soldiers uh, to Venezuela to basically restore order and that general will arrive in April 1815 and his name is Murillo so he comes back in and he does restore order pretty brutally but we'll get to that in a few minutes um, but historians argue that by 1817 that uh, all this infighting has killed something like one out of five Venezuelans, uh, the pre-war population of Venezuela. So uh, it's killed something like 80,000 people out of the 420,000 that had lived in the colony before. So it's, you know, about 20% of the population have been killed in all this warfare. And uh, most of those deaths occurred during the vicious racial wars between Bolivar and Bovis. Uh, between 1813 and 1814. And the problem is that uh, by 1815, 1816, really no faction had won the war so far. Uh, the kind of American colonists, those the colonists that were born in Latin America and grew up in the colony, they could not build a stable enough government to last, either through... Uh, building a government officially recognized by the Spanish state for stability or just declaring independence and trying to create an independent country. Uh, the, the Latin Americans, the colonists, they, they just hadn't figured out uh, how to build a stable enough government to last for the long term. And most of the Spanish-born people uh, in Venezuela, the, those that were born in Spain and then moved over to Venezuela, they were mostly eradicated. They've been killed or they had you know, fled the colony in fear. Um, the black troops who have been promised equality or the end of slavery or anything like that, uh, they didn't get that. They didn't even get any basic freedoms under the new governments who are going to come in under Murillo. And largely the country is devastated by all this fighting and the economy would be bad and, and uh, kind of re in recovery mode for several years. Uh, Murillo, Murillo himself will basically run the colony with an iron hand. He'll set up investigations and trials of accused uh, Republicans who had started and participated in the whole independence movement in the first place. Um, anyone accused and found guilty will be jailed and their 
property will be confiscated and largely sold at auction. So that's happening all throughout Granada, not just uh, what is today Venezuela. And so many people are outraged at uh, what Murillo is doing that they refuse to kind of surrender in the war, even though they can't really fight because they don't have much of an army. Um, they refuse to give in to Murillo because they're so angry at uh, the, the confiscation of property and all these other things um, that they continue fighting, basically. They fight against his army, and he has to reconquer uh, different parts of Venezuela and New Granada uh, piece by piece. So as he's doing that, he executes a lot of Republicans and their leaders uh, in the hundreds. So Murillo is using land confiscation and selling that land at auction, a confiscation of the land that his enemies own. And uh, just selling that land at auction to raise money to pay for his army. Uh, to, to pay them off to continue serving in the army. So those kind of land auctions will largely destroy Bolivar's personal family wealth in Venezuela and the wealth of several of his kind of revolutionary allies. So a lot of elites, a lot of wealthy landowners and businessmen really hate Murillo uh, because he's destroying their economy, he's taking their land, he's shutting down their businesses, those types of things. And a lot of just average workers hated him too. A lot of farmers, a lot of kind of mill workers, or brahe workers, artisans, they largely hate him because of all the revenges he took on the former revolutionaries and the independence leaders. So uh, Murillo is a very repressive force. And a lot of people that are most angry about him, they leave the towns and they go out into the countryside or out into the forest or something, and they start raising new armies, preparing to start another revolutionary war against Murillo and the Spanish government. So what is Bolivar and the other kind of revolutionary generals have been kicked out of Venezuela doing at this time? Uh, they're largely in the Caribbean. And Bolivar himself kind of travels from one colony to another, not to escape capture so much, but to offer deals to the different colonial leaders. And uh, his sales pitch is really, if you support me and give me an army, I'll go back to Venezuela, and I'm not just going to conquer Venezuela from Spain, uh, from the Spanish authorities and make an independent country, but I'll spread that revolution through the rest of South America. So that's a big, big promise. So even as he's making these promises, Bolivar is making contact with these kind of spontaneously rising little armies out in the forest that are going to start launching attacks against the um, official colonial government and army under Murillo. The problem, though, for Bolivar and the general revolutionary movement is that a lot of these revolutionary leaders uh, that are building armies out in the countryside or others that have gone into exile like Bolivar, uh, they don't trust Bolivar. Um, they accuse him of kind of greedy behavior, cowardice, uh, just strange behavior on the battlefield that makes him look kind of erratic, and uh, really just giving up on his responsibility to the people that he says he's leading toward independence. So Bolivar is traveling around trying to get help for a new invasion of Venezuela uh, to take out Murillo and the government. Uh, first, he's negotiating with the British Empire in 1815. But then he goes to Haiti, which, if we remember, is one of the only, if not the only, um, fully independent country that was created by a slave uprising. So the Haitian government will support Bolivar under King Henri I, and uh, the Haitian government will basically demand that any new revolutionary movement in Venezuela will have to be under Bolivar's leadership. So Bolivar will land a new force that he had kind of gathered in Haiti and the Caribbean. A new army will land uh, 
in, uh, was it May, late spring of 1816. Uh, they largely land in the northeast of Venezuela, and he starts issuing government decrees uh, of a revolution, and he's going to be the leader of this new government if it's successful, and general of all the armies. And he also says that any slaves between ages 14 and 59 uh, must join the revolutionary army, and that any able-bodied slaves who do not join the army will result in that person who didn't join that slave and their whole family being forced back into slavery. The problem for Bolivar is that he makes a lot of pretty bad military decisions, how to move his troops around, what to attack and whatnot, that allowed the uh, Murillo's army to basically encircle his forces and defeat them. Uh, Bolivar himself is forced to leave Venezuela, so he gets on some boats in mid-July 1816 and basically runs away, goes back to the Caribbean islands, um, and will try to think of how to accomplish it in the future. So he leaves behind most of his army, including a lot of his lieutenants. So his lieutenants are the ones that are most successful in this war. They break out of the encirclement. They were surrounded and they broke out of it. They fought their way out, and they actually even escaped capture. So they... Um, kind of go back into the kind of periphery of Venezuela out in the kind of borderlands really and they're gonna try to sit out there and, and basically avoid being arrested and try to rebuild their military power. So Bolivar himself eventually returns to Haiti and the Haitian president again is uh, still continuing to support him. The army and, and his lieutenants that are back in Venezuela uh, really still kind of fighting for their own survival, their own lives. Uh, they largely view Bolivar as a traitor and a coward and uh, publicly wrote letters and whatnot saying that they would never work with him again. The problem though is that a lot of these lieutenants could not make deals amongst themselves about who the central leader should be of any uh, attempt to retake the whole uh, country of Venezuela and push it toward independence again. So by October 1816, they invite him, Bolivar, back to return to Venezuela and take up leadership, basically thinking that he was the only one famous enough and had enough respect amongst most of the soldiers to really unite all of these disparate forces together into one unified um, independence movement. So they'll get behind Bolivar, and Bolivar will get even more funding uh, from the Haitian government to launch a new invasion in December 1816, right at the end of the year. Really, they land his army on December 31st, so the last day of the year. It's a much smaller force than he had uh, in the spring of 1816, and Bolivar starts making deals with a lot of the, the lieutenants he had left behind and other generals in Venezuela to try to build a kind of mass unity movement to kick the Spanish loyalists out and make Venezuela again into an independent country. Bolivar kind of proclaims another republic um, going into 1817. So uh, by November 1817, as he banned his influence and the army's kind of conquest and starting to try to unify Venezuela, by November 1817, Bolivar feels confident enough to declare that a third republic now exists. At the same time, a congress is uh, going to be called to start, you know, writing up documents and a constitution and whatnot um, to basically build Venezuela into an independent government again. So a lot of the kind of diplomats and political leaders in Venezuela who want independence, they have to put a lot of pressure on Bolivar to call a Congress because Bolivar doesn't trust Congresses. Uh, he wants to run the government himself uh, as a dictator, basically. So he says that democracy and uh, democratic politics are too weak. They're too unreliable. They make bad decisions and they tend to not last very long. So he says that a government needs a a better, stronger central leader, and of course he always kind of defines himself as the best solution to be that leader. So in November 1817 he appoints what he calls a council of state, which is basically going to be a kind of interim government. 
Then he issues another decree saying again that all uh, men in the colony between ages 14 and 59 must register for the army. They must join the army or be prosecuted as traitors and deserters. And anyone that he defines as a traitor, uh, he can go confiscate their land and sell it off or you know, run an auction or something like that. And a lot of historians argue that this is simply just another war to the death policy. And that Bolivar is just as ruthless in doing these things um, as the Spanish loyalists or the kind of French leaders running Spain or anyone else that he has a lot of um, contempt for, for destroying Venezuela. A lot of historians argue that Bolivar was using a lot of the similar tactics. Um, Bolivar will try a pretty disastrous attempt to attack Caracas directly in the spring of 1818. And many historians argue that Bolivar and his forces only survive a royalist counterattack because the royalists themselves didn't have a big enough army or enough power to launch a counterattack. So once the invasion of Caracas fails, it's not like the royalists capture Bolivar or his army or anything. They get away. Uh, and they're going to go off and train and get ready to fight another day. So the lack of a lot of kind of Republican independence movement unity combines with the fact that the royalists, royalists just don't have enough strength to keep fighting back. Um, the, that combination really makes 1818 into basically a, a military stalemate. Neither side can gain the upper hand. Again, the lawmakers or people who see themselves as lawmakers continue pushing Bolivar to convene some kind of Congress to write up a constitution or a document or start passing laws or something. But again, Bolivar keeps trying to put it off because he doesn't believe in democracy or general elections. He believes in the power of dictators to run the country, but also run it well for most of the people. So even while he's hearing cause, calls to convene a Congress, to work with him to run the new government, Bolivar wants to basically keep on attacking Murillo's royalists. And he figures the best way of doing that is to take another city uh, way out in the west of the vice royalty called Bogota. And he believes that the best way to do that is to actually get around Murillo's defending forces and the way he wants to do that is to go over the Andes Mountains to basically uh, get behind the enemy forces and launch a surprise attack against them from behind and uh, ho he says hopefully that this will force the Spanish to give in to surrender surrender their attempts at making Venezuela back into a colony so Bolivar and his lieutenants and their army start marching through the Andes uh, in about mid-1819. And the areas that they're marching through, we have to remember, about 13,000 feet in elevation. So it's hard to breathe. It's hard to keep moving. And historians estimate that somewhere around one-third of the soldiers who arrived at the foothills to march through the mountains uh, about one-third of them don't make it, and they die. They die en route in marching through the Andes. And so the march to the Andes is uh, full of privation and death, and it's a pretty horrible experience for the soldiers. But the success uh, in Bolivar's goal to get around the Spanish forces, get behind them and attack them from behind, is hugely successful because the Spanish didn't think that anyone was really suicidal enough to try to march an army over the Andean mountains. And Bolivar himself estimated that he lost some, somewhere around one-third of his army just in crossing the mountains. So it's very, very dangerous and took its toll. But Bolivar won what became known as the Battle of Boyaca. And from that point forward, I mean, the, the Royalist army at Boyaca was one of the largest. So once Bolivar is able to conquer Boyaca in early August, uh, he basically controls most of New Granada now.
except for the far western areas west of Bogota, uh, out by Quito or uh, what is today called Ecuador. So at this point, Bolivar goes back to the Congress in Venezuela in December 1819. And uh, he basically makes his demands for what should be included in a constitution that they're writing up. So he wants to declare a unified, what he calls, Republic of Colombia, which would include basically the whole northern uh, viceroyalty of old New Granada. So he wants... Uh, this new Republic of Colombia to include not just Colombia here in the middle and Panama just kind of offshoot of uh, land uh, off of Colombia's western coastline uh, not just those areas but he wants Venezuela to be rolled into this Colombia this Republic of Colombia and also Quito out to the west what is again today Ecuador so Bolivar is dreaming pretty big at this point and he's going to try to go to the Congress and force them to give in to his demands. The new government, though, uh, does try to implement a lot of this idea. Um, they will name Bol Bolivar as interim president until the Constitution is finished and they can hold uh, bigger elections. Um, the government does start uh, creating a Constitution that will create voting rights but it's very kind of scaled voting rights. Um, so they put into the rules of who qualifies to get a vote and how, how many representatives should come from each area. Um, the Congress really stacked the deck in Venezuela's favor. So most of the legislature will be uh, people elected from Venezuela. And that tended to consolidate or centralize power in Venezuela uh, over any of the kind of outlying areas in this larger Republic of Colombia that uh, Bolivar once put into effect. But Bolivar has to keep fighting uh, General Murillo, the Spanish general, who still has control of some land. But the uh, Spanish general, Murillo, is, he doesn't think that he can really win a lot of pitched battles against Bolivar and these large and growing revolutionary armies. So Murillo will basically sit down and hope for Spanish reinforcements to help him make a big military comeback in uh, around the year 1819-1820. But Murillo's hopes for some kind of Spanish reinforcement are dashed when uh, the Spanish liberals in Spain itself uh, basically mutiny on January 1st, 1820 and forced the Spanish king, Ferdinand VII, to restore the 1812 constitution. So that's kind of the back and forth again of what we talked about a few times ago. Um, and that is so confusing for a lot of colonists in uh, this kind of grand Colombia that Bolivar is demanding be built. That, that again gives an opportunity for Bolivar and other independence-minded type people to launch even further attacks in order to guarantee this Republic of Colombia's long-term existence. So we've covered quite a lot of ground today. So we're going to stop here, and next time we'll talk about uh, the rest of the type of Venezuelan revolutions as they start to move further and further south and west down into uh, what on this map is called Peru, but back then was called the Viceroyalty of Peru. So Bolivar is dreaming not just of building this kind of Republic of Colombia up in the north, but he also wants to take armies further and further south along the Pacific coastline and uh, free them from Spanish control. So that's his long-term project. And we'll talk much more in, about that in detail next time. So we'll stop for today.